the, the, the way to think about this, you know, and I, I, I have a, an embarrassing uh, affection for statistics, so you'll, it'll, the, the graphs will go away shortly, but um, in statistics we think about things as being a bell curve, which is the idea that, you know, we're looking for the average consumer. What does the average person want? And, you know, so we, so we, 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 we target products for the average consumer, maybe, you know, medium and then small and large, and then maybe you know, extra large and extra small, et cetera. But it's all targeted around the average consumer. We thought this was kind of the shape of our culture. We're sort of, you know, we're more alike than we are different. Well, that turns out to be not true. That's the wrong curve. The right curve is, is this curve. Um, this curve is called a power law, um, or a Pareto distribution. It's called a Pareto because um, in the late 1800s, an Italian economist named Wilfredo Pareto um, first observed in the Italian economy that 80% of the land was held by 20% of the people. And as you looked around Europe, 80% of the wealth was in the hands of 20% of the people. That you saw this sort of, you know, this gross inequity of distribution, that a few had a lot, and a lot had a few. And he thought this was probably um, a, a, a bug. He thought it was probably an error in the political structure of Europe at the time. He thought it was probably due to feudal systems, or class, uh, class divisions, maybe access to education. Um, wasn't quite sure. Um, and in, in many ways, the rise of socialism and Marxism and communism in the 20th century were driven to level this curve. It didn't work. It didn't work because it turns out that this is the natural shape of our culture. Now, I've shown you some music data, which I'll explain in, in a second. But it turns out that in, everywhere in nature, you get, you get these incredible inequities that some things are very popular and many things are not. You can see some populations. There's some, po there's some species with huge populations and many with smaller populations. We see this in cities. There's a small number of very big cities and a large number of smaller cities. We see this in earthquakes, a small number of big earthquakes, a large number of small earthquakes. We tend to only focus on the big, but the reality is there's a, there's a lot of the little guys as well. Now this particular chart, which comes out of the music industry, I've, I've drawn a line between the red part and the orange part. And the red part represents, so let's assume that this curve reflects what's always been there all along, which is a radical diversity a huge range of products and services, and a huge, huge range of taste. Um, a large range of supply and a large range of demand. But what was missing was what's in between, which is distribution. The red part represents the distribution channels of music in the 20th century, which are largely stores. So the red part represents the largest music retailer in the world, which is the inventory of Walmart, a big retailer um, even here. Um, That's about 50,000 tracks of music at the time this was done. Um, the orange part represents the, all the music that was not available in Walmart. In other words, the red part represents the music world as seen by the average consumer in the 20th century. And the red plus the orange, the whole curve, represents the music as seen by the average consumer in the 21st century. And what we're finding is that, is that it's not all about the blockbuster. This is the data. Um, the, uh, the, 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 let's look at the bar on the left first. The yellow part represents the inventory available online, millions and millions of songs. And the tiny little red part is the inventory available in stores, the biggest stores in the world. And what we're finding is about 40% of the, of the music market today online is music not available in stores. Now we assumed that, that, you know, that, that the blockbuster was the only market. And that it was basically, if, people, if it wasn't going to sell in a store, it wasn't going to sell at all. We assumed that the stores accurately reflected who, what, who we are and what we wanted. And it turns out we were wrong. Um, now what stores reflect are the products that pass the economic test of a store. So a shelf space, a shelf space costs money. And products have to sell a lot to pay the rent on that shelf space ten times a week or 10 times a month, or some, some significant number. Well, most things fail that test. Most products and services do not reach enough people at, you know, at the right time, in the right store, to sell 10 times a week. That doesn't mean there's not demand for them, it just means the demand is distributed. It's distributed over geography, and it's distributed over time. Um, what, you, what you find is that, is that most markets are not concentrated. Um, most markets are fragmented and distributed, but we never had a way to reach markets that were fragmented and distributed until the internet. The internet is the first market that is time and space neutral. 
It does not care where you are and what time, and what time you're, you're looking for something. It is completely agnostic about, about these, these, these dimensions, where the traditional 20th century markers were all about time and space. You have to come into the store when the store is open. And if not enough of you come into the store when the store is open to buy this certain product, that product disappears. It vaporizes. And yet the internet doesn't, doesn't discriminate. The internet has room for the, best, the, the blockbusters and for the niches. So what we're finding is that 40% of, of the music market was stuff that was invisible in the 20th century. The same is true for DVDs, for movies. This is Netflix, a big, a big um, online uh, uh, DVD rental shop in, uh, in America. Um, about, uh, now about a quarter of their DVDs are, are the, the renting, are DVDs not available in stores. And the same, same is true for books. About a quarter of the books sold by Amazon are books not available in bookstores. And, that's, and that, these are new markets that were never before tapped. These are new markets that were neglected. These were, this was a dimension of our character. This was, a, this was an aspect of who we are that was invisible in the 20th century, not because it wasn't, not because you know, we didn't want it, not because it wasn't made, but because our distribution channels didn't have room for it. So that's, that's the lesson of the long tail, which is that you know, the, the, the real impact of the internet is to address minority taste. You know, the 20th century was about majority taste. The 20th century was about the general. And now we have room for the specific. And if every one of us has both elements of this in us. If every one of us has some mainstream taste and some niche taste. You know, some general taste and some specific taste. And what's interesting about the specific taste is often the stuff you like most. I bet I can interview any one of you here and find some aspect of your life where you like something that is cult or niche or underground or unpopular. And that may be the things you love the most. And maybe it's cultural, or maybe it's just, you know, I mean, your family, your town, your, your street, the kind of stuff that doesn't appear in the daily newspaper. And that's often the stuff you care most about. And now we have room for it.